What's up, you guys? Welcome to today's video. So as you can tell by the title, we are going to pick up my series, which I titled Locked Up With. In this series, we talk about inmates that I have been locked up with, and I talk about their case. Today's case is heartbreaking. It is about the wrongful conviction of two individuals, one of which I spent time with. We are going to talk about how Arkansas fumble this case and put two innocent people away. And what makes this worse is that the state of Arkansas is very well aware of the fact that they got this conviction wrong and they're not doing anything about it. I'm going to be talking about Nikki Zinger and Daniel Risher. I will link all of the other episodes that I have done like this on a playlist on a card up here. But without further ado, let's kick this thing off. One Friday morning in 1991, Nikki Zinger and her boyfriend, Daniel Risher, decided to drive down to Shreveport, Louisiana for the day. The couple were both in their 20s, and they lived in Magnolia, Arkansas. Daniel was in a band, and he needed to take his guitar amp to a repair shop in Shreveport, about an hour and a half away. They stopped off to pick up some magazines at the home of Nikki's mother, Linda Holly. Linda was already at work, so Nikki left her a note and the two set off to Shreveport. When they got back last night, they drove past Linda's trailer. Nikki didn't even think to stop and check on her mom because it was so late. The next day was Saturday, and Nikki would call her mom and leave message after message with no reply. On Sunday, Nikki and Daniel decided to go over there and check on her. And when she pulled up, it was a sea of cops. When Nikki asked what happened, they told her that her mother was dead and she was completely shocked. Linda Holly had been viciously murdered. She had been stabbed 12 times and there was also blunt force trauma. Nikki was born in 1963 in Chicago, Illinois, and her and her mom moved down to Arkansas when she was a kid. See, Nikki was born with a couple of medical issues that prevented her from having just a basic childhood. Uh, one of her legs is longer than the other, and she had medical issues that kept her in and out of the hospital. So her mom, Linda, was her caregiver forever. They did everything together. Nikki's dad wasn't in the picture. Nikki was quoted as saying, my dad was never part of my life because he was always drinking and drugging. He was mentally and physically abusive to us both. As I got older, he tried to come and see me a few but he was always drunk and my mother asked him, can you not come see your only child sober? Because he was pushing me one day and he pushed me out on the swing and just left me there. Linda was a nurse and worked as a director with the health department, but Nikki says she could have done so much more with her life. Nikki said in a podcast interview that I will link in the description box down below, she said she was smart enough to be a doctor. She just didn't, I think, because of me, because of my problems. I was born with a club foot and a foot drop, and I was born paralyzed and a stroke in the brain. So she needed a lot of medical attention throughout the course of her life, where she would be hospitalized for quite a while and miss out on a lot of school. So when she was strong enough and able to go back to school, the friends that she had once made were really not interested in hanging out with her again because she was always coming and going. And I relate a lot to that as well because I moved around a lot. Not the physical medical stuff, but it was, kids are weird about that. I, I would go to one school for a year and then transfer out and go to a different school and go back to that school. Kids are weird about it. They're like, where have you been? And you never know how to explain that as a child. So I definitely relate to some degree in terms of what Nikki is saying here. So she really didn't have a lot of friends growing up and spending some time with her in prison, I could definitely see that reserved lack of trust, maybe a little bit socially awkward person that she describes in childhood. In the interview that I will link down below, she talks about people watching with her mom. And you could see that is still very much a part of who she is because she will, she will sit on her rack and she'll just watch people. I was in the bunk right next to her for quite some time while she was serving a little bit of time in the Wrightsville unit for medical issues. I was there while I was pregnant. And I probably had slept next to her for two or three days before she really said much to me. Um, very reserved, definitely didn't uh, trust me very easily, which justifiably so. You can't trust anyone in prison. But we're going to get more into my time with her once I talk a little bit more about her case. So she meets one guy, uh, gets married, divorces in six months time, and now uh, she is on the hunt. And not really, but uh, her and her mom did everything together from people watching, even like looking for guys for Nikki while she was people watching 
probably just like that common like oh he's kind of cute do you think he's cute that's kind of the stuff that they did unfortunately linda was diagnosed with cancer So she did chemo and radiation, and that role changed in Nikki's life, where her mom was her caregiver for such a long time, and now she's transitioned into her mother's caregiver. I'll cover more of that in a second. So Nikki meets this man named Daniel Risher, and she is immediately attracted to him. He asks her out, and they start dating for a while, and things are going pretty well. Her and Daniel had a lot of stuff in common, like music. Nikki is a classic rock fan. She likes Zeppelin and ACDC and stuff like that. Uh, And so does Daniel. Things finally seem to be turning around. Um, Nikki has a boyfriend and she's super happy. Things are calm. Her mom uh, was fighting cancer though. And she went into remission, but then the cancer reappeared. So that was really difficult, obviously. But Linda was all the family that Nikki had. She didn't have any siblings. Her father wasn't in the picture. No aunts, no uncles. Really all she has in the world is Linda, her mother, and this new boyfriend, Daniel. On Friday, March 8th, 1990, Linda Holly's neighbor saw her getting her mail out of her mailbox and she was in her scrubs. That was the last time that anyone saw her alive. After two days of Linda not answering the phone, the neighbor went to her house to check on her and she immediately saw the door kicked in. The neighbor called Linda's best friend. Now there's two people that are contaminating a crime scene and we're gonna get into that. They called the cops. Now the cops are on scene. They have their guns drawn. They're looking through everything. They're stepping in blood. They're stepping in glass. They're stepping on paperwork. Um, And, you know, that makes sense because they have to see if anyone else is in the home. But they eventually find Linda dead. It was just a brutal, heinous murder. Things are gone through. Things are, you know, it just, it, it's a complete mess. From this moment on, there would be several different accounts from law enforcement as to what happened, what they saw when they arrived on the scene, etc. But the crime scene was not secured. People were walking through and kind of just looking at the whole scene. You know, what, is this a robbery gone wrong? What is this? There was a lot of different, you know, um, A lot of different theories, but they never took the time to make sure that no one entered this trailer. They did not take the time to even secure off the perimeter of the trailer. Looking for common things like tire prints, footprints, fingerprints, none of that stuff. Maybe some debris or things that the the murderer could have like dropped along the way. They didn't do any of that. I understand the, um, the stress that comes with that kind of job. But it was very clear that these officers had no experience in dealing with a murder case. They only had one theory to go on, and that is the only people in the world um, closest to Linda were Nikki and Daniel. So their theory was that Nikki and Daniel conspired to murder Linda for the life insurance money. And do y'all want to know how much this life insurance policy was? $90,000. Like, sure good chunk of change. Not enough to commit murder. Do you guys understand how expensive funerals are? There was a complete lack of motive because Linda was was once again having to fight cancer. The doctors were convinced that this was terminal, that she wouldn't survive this. So, you know, as, as awful as it sounds, why are you going to murder somebody that doesn't have that long to live, that is going to die of, of this disease? And she has a life insurance policy for that so that Nikki could give her a proper burial. It just didn't make any sense, but law enforcement didn't really have anything to go on. They had no DNA evidence to go on. What makes it even worse is that for days, law enforcement told Nikki that it was okay for her to go into the trailer to get out whatever personal belongings that she wanted. Um, So she was, you know, looking for paperwork. This is a really standard thing because when someone passes away, you have to prove that they're dead. You have to get multiple copies of a death certificate. It makes sense. You know, does she have a will in there? What what did she want to happen to her after she passed away? Did she want to be cremated or buried? You know, so looking for paperwork makes complete sense. But they would later use the fact that Nikki had this paperwork in her possession as a motive, I guess. Law enforcement gets search warrants to search Daniel's parents' home and they find a hunting jacket and hunting boots and there is blood on that. I will circle back to that, I promise. With this circumstantial evidence, they decide to get um they decide to charge Nikki and Daniel with first degree murder. 
Arkansas also at this time had this very weird habit of kind of like honing in on the way a person dresses, what kind of music they like, is it cult-like? And we saw that in the um, in the West Memphis Three investigation where they were like, these three boys, they like rock, they like metal, they dress like this, they're definitely murderers, they're satanic, devil-worshipping murderers. We don't have any evidence to support that, but look at them, which is kind of the energy that they went in with Daniel and Nikki. They, they liked punk rock, so they must have killed her mother. Bruh. Despite Nikki and Daniel having a strong alibi of not even being in town at the time of the murder, law enforcement completely ignored that. Law enforcement and prosecutors also completely ignored another murder that happened just five days later and like a few miles down the road. The case of Bernice Rankin. Same exact thing. She was found stabbed and beaten inside of her residence. That case to this day remains unsolved. The Innocence Project picked up this case and they asked for multiple testing to be done, especially DNA testing. So remember that jacket that I just mentioned of Daniel's? It was a hunting jacket and it had blood on it. The crime lab came back and said that that was not definitively human blood. And Daniel said, yeah, it's deer blood. I'm a hunter. So there's no actual evidence of either one of these people murdering Linda. No evidence at all. It is all circumstantial. There was no DNA evidence. They didn't even have a confession, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and when they finally did DNA testing in 2016, keep in mind, keep in mind that this happened in 91. It's been a long time. When DNA testing did happen, it was not Linda Holly's blood. It was freaking deer blood, probably, because it wasn't human. A few years back, the Arkansas Parole Board granted parole to both Nikki and Daniel. Why are they still incarcerated right now? Because the governor of Arkansas, Hutchinson, he said, no, we're not going to let them out. So you have to wonder, like, did you even look at this case or did you see a stack of cases on your desk and just say no to everybody? You know, Arkansas is really tough when it comes to letting anyone parole out that has this kind of case, this kind of charge. It's also really sad, but important to note that Nikki and Daniel were both represented by lawyers that had absolutely no freaking clue what they were doing. You know, they, they weren't experienced in trial or this kind of crime. The most damaging testimony came from Don Smith, a criminalist for the Arkansas State Crime Lab. His testimony centered around luminol and blood testimony. Luminol is a chemical that reacts when applied to various substances, including blood. The clear intention was to have the jury believe that luminol testing done on various items, including a hunting jacket, boots, and other things revealed that the substance it was reacting to was the victim's blood. But luminol reacts to a variety of substances and doesn't show if the substance it's reacting to is in fact blood, much less human blood, and certainly not a particular person's blood. However, that testimony was allowed to be used in trial. What is the most shocking to me is that law enforcement let them go into the trailer to take out personal belongings, and there was a lot of blood. She was stabbed 12 times. There was blunt force trauma. It was not, you know, it was not a secured or clean space for them to go into. So even if there was some blood, like on their shoes maybe, or on a, a shirt or anything like that, it would make sense because they were told to go in there to clean up this mess. Crime scene investigators didn't even show up for like three freaking days. So it would make sense that there would be some kind of transfer of DNA from one place to another because that uh, crime scene wasn't secured. Nikki's conviction date was January 17th of 1992. That means she's been incarcerated 32 years, 11 months, and 20 days. I kind of want to transition now into talking about the time that I spent with Nikki. So when I got to Wrightsville, she was sleeping in the bunk right next to me and... She was older, obviously, and I kind of had a feeling that she had a life sentence. I think it was probably two or three days later that we even really talked or said anything. Uh, at this time, I was pregnant with my daughter, Micah. Nikki was very reserved, quiet. You could tell that like she just, her energy was heavy. She didn't openly talk about her case very much with me. I'm not even going to pretend that I know, I know every detail from her mouth other than the podcast that I've listened to. She did tell me that she was in prison for first degree murder of a murder she did not commit. A journalist by the name of Maggie Freeling, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm sorry, girl, if I just butchered that. Um, she reached out to me on Instagram and she's like, hey, you were in 
in Arkansas prison. Do you know Nikki Zinger? And when she said that name, I was like, I do. I do know who that person is. I hadn't thought about her case in so long, but every time I had read my prison journal, I kept trying to remember Nikki's last name and I, for the life of me, I could not remember it. I've wanted to tell you guys her story for a really long time. There are some people that you meet in prison that you're like, oh, they, they did it for sure. Or, you know, they're just not really a good person. I've met people and they've told me about their case and literally before even hearing anything about their case, I would talk to them or be close to them and the hair on the back of my neck would stand up. You don't get that with Nikki. You can tell that she's probably a little bit socially awkward, definitely reserved, people watching, you know? She keeps to herself. With all the medical issues that she has, there is no reason to continue to keep her in state custody. She is not a threat to anyone. She just needs to come home. But I remember this one time, I've told this story before, but I remember this one time that I got $300 back from the state of Arkansas because when I was put in jail, I had $300 on me, like on my person. It was separate from the money that was seized when I was arrested. And yes, I know the police report doesn't list money. They do that. Anyway, I was so excited that I got $300 in. Like when you have no commissary and you get 300 bucks, you're like, hell yeah. So I am sitting on my bunk and I'm like filling out the commissary slip. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get this snack. And I'm going to make this. I'm going to make that. I want to make cheesecake. Nikki looks over to me and she goes, baby, you might want to save some of that. $300 goes fast. And I'm like, oh, you're right. No, you're right. I was just so excited to get something. Um, I remember asking her if there was anything that she wanted and she told me no. Now, Nikki does not have a lot of money. She doesn't get a lot of commissary. I think I ended up getting her like a couple of soups and some crackers. Um, but she wasn't very like, yeah, this is what I want. Get me that. No, she's not that kind of person. Most inmates, if you ask them if they want any food or any extras or like, is there something that they can get you? They're going to be like, yeah, let me get you a list. <laughs> You know, but Nikki just, she's not that way. She really cares about people around her. I also remember trying to get her to feel Micah kicking my belly. Uh, and every single time Nikki would put her hand on my stomach and Micah would be kicking, she'd just stop. It was just super funny. It was super funny trying to catch her. This was my entire pregnancy, but it was always super funny trying to catch her kicking me. Um, with Riley, her foot was like sticking out of my stomach. Not out of my stomach, but you could see Riley's footprint for like a long time. That was super creepy. I think if I, I think as a first time mom, if I would have seen Micah's footprint or handprint just stick out of my stomach for a while, that would have, that would have freaked me out, dude. I'm going to write Nikki and send her a little bit of commissary. I'm going to put a ton of ads in here and donate what I can to her commissary using this video to do that. On top of what I'm going to send right now, this is net 30, calm down. I'm also going to leave her address and her ADC number in the description box down below if you guys want to send her a card. Um, and just tell her that, you know, you're thinking of her and hopefully we can get a new set of eyes on this. There was a nonprofit that was working on her case and I, I think they still kind of are working on the case. They ended the nonprofit. What's interesting is one of the West Memphis three, Jason, I believe, he was actually part of the nonprofit that was trying to help, you know, Nikki. If Nikki writes me back, which I'm positive that she will, um, I will make another video, follow-up video. I wonder if she remembers me. <laughs> all right, I'm going to end today's video here. As always, I love you guys. I will leave all the information, podcasts, news articles, a place to donate to commissary, her address, if there's a petition. I don't know if there is. I will I will try to find that and, and leave that in the description box as well. And I'm, I'm going to be doing everything that I can behind the scenes to get more eyes on this, the right eyes, people that can hopefully help get her out of prison because... There's no reason that she needs to be there. She never should have gone to prison in the first place, but 32 years for a crime she didn't commit. It's just really sad. Bye, you guys.